section is about as easy as the last one. You've probably already seen how to do elimination. So um, substitution is the most basic technique, and you have to know how to do substitution to, in order to do any of the advanced techniques, including elimination. Okay? So there are some other methods that we're going to learn, and we're going to focus on those probably throughout most of this uh, particular chapter and, and part of the next. So this other ex, uh, uh, technique is called elimination. And it's called elimination because we're going to eliminate the variables one by one. So if we take a look at this one right here, if I call this equation number one and this equation number two, you'll notice that right here I have a 1x and right here I have a negative 1x. Okay? If this is a true equation and this is a true equation, if the two sides are equal to each other, I should be able to add those together and make another equation that's also a true equation. So if I just take equation 1 and equation 2 and add them together, I get 1x minus 1x, that's 0x. I get 3y plus 4y, so that's 7y, and 7 plus 7 is 14. So I've eliminated one of the variables. I've now got an equation with only one variable, and I can solve that, so I get y equals... Two. Then I take that, and what do I do with it? You plug it in. We back substituted is what we called it. Now, does it matter which one we plug it into? Does it doesn't matter at all. It's probably easier to plug it into the first one. So this would be x plus 3 times 2 equals 7. So this is x plus 6 equals 7. So this would be x equals 1. There are the two answers, and we, of course, write that as an ordered pair, 1 comma 2. If I want to do this one using elimination, this one's a little bit more difficult. Okay, There are a couple different things that I can do here. And the reason this, that the x went away here is because one of them was a positive 1x and the other one was a negative 1x. So I've got to make these so they have the same coefficient but different signs is what I'm after here. Now, which one do you want to eliminate? Do you want to eliminate the x or the y? The y is probably easier, isn't it? Because I can just take this first equation right here, and if it's a true equation, if I double everything, so if I make this a 10x, and if I make that a 6y, and if I make that a 46, that red equation that I just wrote there is, a, is another true equation. So I actually have one, two, three equations right here. All three of them are true equations. Three is kind of a copy, a little bit of an adjustment to equation number one. But if I then add these two together, I get 11x, I get no y's, and over here I have a 44. So that means x is equal to 4. And then I can take this and I can plug it in. Well, let's see, does it matter on this one? I could plug it into 1, 2, or 3. Which one probably would be the easiest? Probably number 2, because if I do 4 minus 6y equals negative 2. I can move that to the other side, so that would be negative 6y equals negative 6, so I get y equals 1. And then again, the ordered pair would be 4 comma 1. That would be my answer there. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so let's just write down a couple of steps here. Um, make x or y in each equation have the same coefficient but different signs. Okay? Combine the equations to make another equation with fewer variables. That's where the elimination part comes in. Continue steps one and two until you get an equation with one variable that can be solved. And that happens very quickly if you've got just a, a two by two system is what we call this. Two equations and two unknowns. Back substitute to get the other answers. Okay, and write your answers in ordered pair. Okay? Any questions? All right, let's take a look at these then. Okay, so it says solve by, whoops, another typo. Solve by elimination. I'll catch those. So solve by elimination. So this one's a little bit more difficult. Okay, what makes this one more difficult? Yeah, you have to change them both. Okay, you don't have to just change one equation. You have to change them both. Which one probably is going to be easier to get rid of, the X or the Y? Probably x. How come? Smaller numbers. That's all there is to it. The advantage y has is they're both different signs already, but we'd have to make them both into a 56. So we have to multiply by a relatively large number. 
So I'm going to take this one and I'm going to multiply it by 2. And I'm going to take this one and I'm going to multiply it by negative 5. So that's going to give me 10x minus 14y and then negative 32. If I multiply this one by negative 5, now what you've got to be careful with is you don't make some silly little mistake. So that's a minus 40y. And if I multiply by negative 5, I end up with negative 130. Is that correct? Okay. Now I can put them together. Again, our goal was to eliminate the x, which it does. It goes away here. This is negative 54y. And then if I put the two of those together, I get negative 162. And what we're hoping is that this goes in evenly so we don't have to work with fractions. And lo and behold, does it go in evenly? It does. It goes in three times. Okay. Now, again, I've actually got four equations that I could choose from here. Which one's going to be the easiest one to plug it into? One, two, three, or four? Probably the second one. Okay. All of those are still true equations, but we just want to pick the easiest one. So we're going to plug this in right here. And I, I said it's usually a good idea to plug things in in parentheses. So this is 2x plus 24 equals 26. So this is 2x equals 2. So x is equal to 1. So I get 1 comma 3. And again, that's the point where these lines would cross. If we were to graph these and solve this uh, using the graphing technique, that's where they'd cross. Okay, any questions? Okay, that's the basic idea behind the whole section. As long as you could come up with the, the equations from the story problems and different things like that, they all should be about that easy. But there are a couple little things that we ought to be aware of. Let's take a look at this one right here. What is not so nice about this one? Decimals. Okay, we've got decimals. So what can we do? Okay. Well, you could work them like this. You could change them into fractions if you wanted to, but most people probably wouldn't like doing that. Okay, what are we going to do here? I think Tara mentioned it yesterday. What are we going to do? Move the decimal over. So if I take this equation, basically what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that first equation by 10, and that's going to move the decimal over. So I've got 5x plus 3y equals 9. And on this one, if I multiply that one by 10 also, I have 2x minus 4y equals 14, and then I solve from there. Okay. Um, probably the easier one to eliminate. You think it matters on this one? I, I don't think it does. It's really a question of whether or not you like multiplying by 5 and 2 or 3 and 4 better. The nice thing about getting rid of uh, the y's on this one is I'd only have to multiply this one by 3 and I'd have to multiply that one by a 4. I'd be multiplying by a positive on each one of them. So I end up with 20x plus whoops, 12y, 36. Multiplying this one by 3, I get 6x. I get minus 12y. And multiplying by 3 there, I end up with 42. So when I put those together, it does get eliminated. I get 26x. And then I get, uh, let's see, 78. Is that right? which happens to go in evenly, so I get x equals 3, and then I can back substitute there. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to finish that, but I do want you to watch up here for just a second. Everybody watch. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 true equations on here. Okay, These are each copies of these guys right here, but as long as we're doing something that's algebraically legal, multiplying both sides by the same number, Dividing both sides by the same number, adding the same thing to both sides, I get another true equation, right? Okay, any questions there? Okay, I want to look at the last two on this page, and we'll just set these up as far as how, how we're going to solve these, um, and then maybe we'll go ahead and finish. Um, does anybody want to do this one with the fractions in it? Cameron does. Okay. Okay, there's, there's something wrong with this one. Does anybody see something that's wrong right away other than the fractions? Okay, the, the y is not in the right place. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think of this one as 
Um, this is going to be 2 fifths x. I'm going to move this over here, so that's minus 1 fifth y. And then over on the other side, if I move that over, that would be 3 fifths, right? Okay, so we're done with that one. If you want to work with the fractions, you could. Cameron, are you going to work this whole thing with fractions? Okay, Cameron's going to. Is there a way we could get rid of the fractions? Yeah, multiply the first equation by 3. So this would be 4x minus 2y equals 6. And if I multiply this one by 5, I'd get rid of all the denominators. Now, it doesn't always happen that way that multiplying by one single number gets rid of all the denominators there, but it does in this case. So this is 2x minus y, and over here we get a 3. Or sorry, a 15, right? No, we, get a, we do get a 3. Yeah, we do get a 3. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to go through and I'm going to multiply this, uh, this first one. Uh, let's do the second one. Let's multiply the second one by a positive 2. And I'd end up with a 4x. Or sorry, a negative, a negative 2. A 2y. And I'd have a negative 6. And what happens if I put the two of those true equations together? I get a zero on this side and a zero on that side. Anybody know what that means? Okay, well, let's, let's stop and think about this. Is this a true equation? Okay, is there anything we can do to screw it up? Anything we could do to make it a false equation? Nope. So this is always true. So we're going to have a whole bunch of answers, okay? Anything that works in one of the equations would work in the other equation is what it's mean, meaning. Okay, so this has, I think I heard somebody say it, infinitely many solutions. And those solutions would look like this. Anything where 2x minus y is equal to 3 would work. You know, has anybody heard of set builder notation? Okay, set builder notation would look like this. We'd say it's any xy pair, and then we do this vertical line. Anybody know what that vertical line means? Such that 2x minus y equals 3. So we could say there are infinitely many solutions. Anything that works in this line would be uh, the answer. And if we use set builder notation, that's kind of a mathematical shorthand way of saying the exact same thing. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Uh, anybody solve this next one? What'd you get? No solution. Okay. How did you get no solution? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this one by a negative two. That's the easiest thing to do here, isn't it? That's going to make this a negative 10x. That's going to make this a minus 6y, and that's going to make this a negative 4. So when I combine this side together, I get a 0, and then on the other side, I get a 4. Now, compare these two answers, this one right here with this, with this one right here. This one says 0 equals 0. That's always true. And is this ever true? Nope. And there's nothing we could do to make it true, so because this is never true, we get no solution. Okay? Any questions? Okay, this page covers all the different types of things you're possibly going to see. It's got everything from no solution to infinitely many solutions. Okay, you've got fractions, you've got decimals, you've got all sorts of stuff to deal with there. But that goes over the ideas behind elimination. Everybody okay with that? Okay, um, I'm hoping you're in good shape in solving those. If you take a look at the back side, there are four problems. We're going to take a look at three of them in depth, and one of them is an example from the textbook. I just want to show it to you, and it's, it's relatively easy. So this first example right here on the back side, it says a jet flies four hours west with a 60-mile-per-hour tailwind. The return trip against the wind takes five hours. Find the speed of the jet with no wind. Find the speed of the jet with no wind. Okay. So we've got a couple things going on here. We're going to need to use this equation. We've all seen that before, right? What's the D stand for? Distance, Distance that you travel, okay, is your rate, how fast you're going, multiplied by your 
time. Distance equals rate times time. Okay? Now, you've got several different problems, and there are variations of these. They're, they're, these are just kind of classic algebra problems. Okay? If I've got the jet going with the wind, okay, I take the speed of the jet, and I add the speed of the wind to figure out how fast I'm actually going. Okay? A tailwind actually speeds us up. Okay? If I've got the wind and the jet going against each other, okay, they're not working together to um, increase the speed. What are they doing? They're working against each other. All right. So I've got to subtract this. Now, do I do W minus J or do I do J minus W? Okay, I need to do J minus W. Speed of the jet plus the wind if we've got a tailwind, if they're working together, if they're going in the same direction. And you've always got to do the speed of the jet minus the wind if they're working against each other. It has to be in that order. Okay, you wouldn't want to do it in the other order because if I did the wind minus the jet, okay, I could end up going backwards or something like that. Now, if you have a problem that deals with like a boat going downstream or a boat going upstream, it's the same thing. If the boat is going downstream, you do the boat plus the current. And if it's going upstream, you do the boat minus the current. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So let's keep track of what we know here. So we've got distance, rate, and time. Okay? Does it say anything about how far it went? It doesn't. Okay? So we're going to put D1 for the distance on the first trip. Okay? Uh, flies four hours west with a 60 mile per hour tailwind. We do know the time. The time is four hours. Do we know the rate for the jet? What is it? Okay. So this is going to be the jet plus 60, right? So we don't know the distance, but we do know that we're taking the speed of the jet and adding 60 miles per hour to it, and we're traveling that, uh, that fast for four hours. Okay. And on the return trip, so I'm going to call that D2, It's going against the wind, and it takes it five hours. So the time is five hours. And how do I mark this down? Jet minus 60. Okay? So this first distance would be J plus 60 times 4. And the other one would be D2 would be J minus 60 times 5. Now, um... Is this a system of equations? Yep. We don't know two things on each one of them, right? We don't know the distance and we don't know the speed of the jet. Okay. Um, what do you know about these guys, though? They're the same because the we went there and we went back. So the return trip is exactly the same. So we've actually got, if you wanted to think of it this way, we've actually got three different variables. But we could just say the distance is the same on both of them. So what are we going to do with this? We're going to set them equal. Okay. Is this substitution or elimination? Substitution. Okay. So let's go ahead and set the two of these equal. This would be uh, J plus 60 times 4 equals J minus 60 times 5. Distribute through, I get 4J plus 240. I get 5J minus 300 and I'm going to move the 300 over here and the 4j over here so that's going to give me 540 equals a j and what does j stand for again speed of the jet so how fast is the jet 540 miles per hour could we figure out how far it went then yeah we could figure out the distance they didn't ask us to but we could figure out the distance if we needed to. We just plug that in here. Okay. So let's see, it was going 300, or sorry, 600 miles an hour for four hours. So 2,400 miles would have been how far it goes. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, please make sure you keep track of this. Whenever you've got an airplane problem um, where the, it's got a tailwind or a headwind, you've got a boat going down a river or up a river. It's always going to be whatever the, the device is, so a, an airplane or a boat, plus or minus the current or the, the wind or whatever it happens to be. It has to be in that order. Okay.
Any questions there? Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Same type of problem, but a little bit different. It says a jet flying into a headwind travels 2,000 miles between uh, two cities in four hours and 24 minutes. Okay, on the return flight, the jet covers the same distance in four hours. Find the speed of the jet and the speed of the wind, assuming both remain constant. Okay, so let's keep track of these again. Distance, rate, and time. What do we know is exactly the same for both of the trips? The distance. What's the distance? 2,000. Okay, so on both of them, we've got 2,000 for a distance that we covered. Okay. What about the rate? Do we know how fast it's going? In fact, on this one, we don't even know the speed of the wind, do we? Okay. But we do know that on its way there, it had a headwind. So is it working with the wind or against the wind? Against. So I'm going to do, go ahead and write it down. I'm going to write a J and a W. J first, W second. Because it's a headwind, what do I write? Subtract. I, I subtract. Because the wind is working against the jet. Okay. Now, the time on this one is a little bit funky. It's four hours and 24 minutes, and the other one's just hours. Okay, it's going to be a lot easier if I put a four here. Of course, this is going to be a J plus a W, right? And let's make this time, let's make this in hours. So let's put, make that a decimal, a fraction of an hour. It would be 24 sixtieths of an hour, which if you check is two-fifths, which is... 0.4, right? So this is 4.4 hours. Okay, now, if we do distance equals rate times time, this is 2,000 equals J minus W times 4.4. This is 2,000 equals J plus W times 4. And this doesn't quite look like an equation or a system of equations that we have uh, normally. But if I distribute through here, this is what I get. I get 4.4j minus 4.4w equals 2,000. And on this one, I get 4j plus 4w equals 2,000. And this looks more like a system of equations that we would solve. Okay, now, would it be worth it to move the decimal over on this one? De depends on who you are. Okay, it depends on what you like doing. Do you like always working with whole numbers? If so, you'd want to move that over, and this would be 20,000. If you don't mind working with a decimal, then what we'd want to do is... Let's take this, and let's say I want to eliminate, well, which one would be the easiest one to eliminate? I think the W would be. How can I make that a 4.4? Times it by 1.1, okay? If this were a 4 and a 44, we'd multiply by 11, okay? So I'm going to multiply by 1.1. That's going to give me 4.4J. That's going to give me 4.4 W, and that's going to give me, if I multiply the two of these together, isn't that 2,200? Isn't that right? So I'm going to take equation number one, and I'm going to take this copy of equation number two, and I'm going to put the two of those together. So that's going to give me 8.8 .8 J, no W's. And if I put the two of these together, I get 40, is that 4,200? And then what we're hoping is that this goes in evenly. I've got the J there, because that stands for the speed of the jet. Divide by 8.8, .8, and what do we get? 477.27. Is that right? Um, any decimals after that? Or is that? Okay, so it repeats. Okay? And that's going to be miles per hour. Now, 
What do I need to do with that? I need to plug it back in. Um, of these equations that I've got here, which one's probably the easiest? Pro probably this one right here. Probably that one right there. It's got the whole numbers in there. So we're going to do 4 times 477, did you say? Plus 4W equals 2,000. So we're going to move that over, divide by 4, and anybody got the answer for W? Might not be a bad idea to have that one um, stored in your calculator so you don't lose any decimal accuracy. Anybody got it yet? What'd you get? 22.727. And I bet that repeats too, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, do me a favor. If you add those together, don't you get 500? Okay. And um, if you add those together, that's going to be a tailwind. Okay. And wouldn't you cover 2,000 miles in four hours? Did we get it right? I think we did. Okay. All right. Any questions on those two? Okay. Would you read the next problem then? Okay, raise your hand if you've done one like this before. A couple of you? Okay, all right. Um, mixture problems are another classic type of algebra problem. Um, there are lots of different ways to explain how to do these. I like explaining them this way, and I think this works uh, uh, pretty well every time. Um, so we want to be able to keep track of stuff here. And remember uh, the other day when we introduced this, I said usually we're going to end up with two equations if, if we're you know, coming from a story problem, two equations about two different things, whether it's a trip there and a trip back. Um, we were talking about um, total amounts and interest in the last section. And on this one, we've got um, two different things going on. So here's what we're going to keep track of. Um, I'm going to call this first solution, solution A, solution B, and then I've got this new mix. And I'm going to keep track of amounts, percents, and pure substance, whatever it happens to be that we're measuring. It might be, um, you know, uh, nitrogen or alcohol or, you know, a certain dye or something like that. In this case, it's pure nitrogen. So... Uh, fertilizer company has two nitrogen solutions. Solution A is 3% nitrogen. Solution B is 8% nitrogen. The company would like to make 900 gallons of a new solution that's 6% nitrogen, so somewhere in between. Okay? How much of solutions A and solutions B should, should be used to make the new solution? Okay? So in this column right here, we're going to keep track of the amounts. I guess I could have written it in these boxes here. Okay? So, do I know how much of solution A I'm going to use? I don't, so I'm going to use an A. I'm going to rewrite those. Do I know how much of solution B I'm going to use? Nope. Like any good story problem, it ends with a question that tells you what you're looking for. Do I know how much I'm going to have when I'm done mixing them together? Read carefully, 900 gallons right here, right? 
I know I've got to have 900 gallons. So I'm going to dump in a certain amount of solution A, of mixture A, and they're going to dump in a certain amount of B. But when I get done, I better have a big barrel with 900 gallons of this new mixture in it. Does that make sense? Okay, what percent nitrogen is solution A? 3%. So I'm going to say 3% here. Solution B is 8%. And when I get done mixing them together, it's going to be somewhere in between, so it's going to be 6%. Okay, now listen very carefully to this. If I had 100 gallons and it was 3% nitrogen, how much pure nitrogen is in that 100 gallons? Three gallons, right? Three out of the 100 gallons would have to be pure nitrogen in order for the whole thing to be 3% nitrogen, okay? What if it was 200 gallons? How many gallons of pure nitrogen do I have? Six. Six gallons, right? I just multiply the two of those together, okay? So if I have 900 gallons and it's 6% nitrogen, how much pure nitrogen do I have to have in there? Yeah, you multiply them together. So we would do 0 0.06 times uh, 900 and I get 54 gallons, right? Well, if I multiply these two numbers together to make that number right there, let's multiply these two numbers together. So this is going to be 0 0.08 times B, and this is going to be 0 0.03 times A. Okay, now, in this table are two equations. This right here is an equation, and this right here is an equation. So if I were to take this much of A and add it to this much of B, how much should I get altogether? I better get 900 gallons, right? Because that was, the, that was what we, this company wanted. If I add this much pure nitrogen from A, so 0 0.03 A to 0 0.08 B, how much pure nitrogen should I have altogether? I better end up with 54. Okay. And there are the two equations. So in this table, even though it has three columns, there are two equations. Okay, This is an equation just about the amount that we're going to dump into this tank. And this is an equation about the pure nitrogen. Okay, Why is this not an equation? Why can't you make an equation of this right here? Is there, is there any way these things add up to be 6? Nope. Okay. So this column right here, all we're doing is we're just keeping track of percentages there. Okay, The equation about amounts comes from this one. The equation about the amount of pure nitrogen in this case comes from that one. And then could you solve that? Um, turns out not to be too terribly bad. A plus B equals 900. And if I do 0.03 A plus 0.08 B equals 54, um, if you want to get rid of the, uh, the decimals, be my guest, move that over a couple of places and you'd be fine. If you want to just take this one and let's say I multiply this by negative 0.03, it's still not that bad. This would be negative 0.03a, negative 0.03b, and this would be negative. If I multiply those together, don't I get 27? 0 0.03 times 900, isn't that 27? Somebody want to double check me there? And then I can just add them together. This is going to be 0.05B, and this is going to be 27. And then you can go from there. Everybody good with that? Did I, did I do my arithmetic correctly? Brandon, you're non-responsive this morning. You're not helping me out. Okay, before you get done, which one are we going to use more of, solution A or solution B? Why? Why should you be able to figure that out even before you start? Because it's 8%, and what's our target percentage? 6. So how do you know it's got to be more 8 than 3? Because 6 is closer to 8. If we wanted a 4% solution, we'd use a lot of the 3% and just add a little bit of the 8%. Does that make sense? Remember those vector problems? 
the bigger vector pulls it more in that direction. The higher percentage, the more, if we want to pull it uh, more than halfway there, we've got to use more of that higher percentage. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Do I need to finish that one? What, what did you end up with? You ended up with B equals 540, and then we figure out what's left by plugging that in right here. So that would be, is that 360? So for A, we'd use 360 gallons. Okay. All right. Um, I just want you to take a look at the last one. This is called finding the point of equilibrium. It says the supply and demand functions uh, for a certain uh, calculator are given by this. So this is the demand equation, and this is the supply equation, where P is the price in dollars and X represents the number of units. Find the point of equilibrium for this market. Okay. Now, these are pretty easy to work with, right? Set up for substitution or elimination. Substitution. You'd set the two P's equal to each other. Okay, this equation set equal to that equation, and that will give you an X. Let's look at this diagram right here, and let's figure out what this means. Okay? Um, so, everybody's heard of the law of supply and demand, right? No? Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are people after here? Maybe concert tickets or something like that? What do, what do we like? Okay, let's put it this way, okay? Let's say, let's say Logan was going to shave his head. <laughs> and Logan was going to sell tickets. Okay? Let's say Logan wanted to do it out by the pavilion, okay? Outside, and there was tons and tons of space, okay? So tons of people could come there, okay? Um, mm, let's see. If there were, I mean, would there be a pretty high demand for people seeing Logan? Okay, yeah. Would you be willing to pay a couple bucks for that? I, I know I would, right? Okay, what if Logan said, I'm going to shave my head, but I'm only going to let 10 people watch, and I'm, I'm still going to sell tickets for it? Okay? If you were going to be only one of 10 people, do you think he'd sell them for a couple bucks, or do you think he could raise the price? Raise the price, okay? Because there might be, I mean, there's what? Almost 300 people at the school. I bet there are probably 299 that would want to watch that. Okay? So if we, if we decrease the supply, usually the demand goes up. Okay? Um, and if there's a whole bunch of supply, if we flood the market with tickets for Logan's haircutting ceremony, okay, then the, then the price would go down. Okay? So those two things are related. If there's a very high demand, then the price is going to go up. And if there's a low demand, then the price is going to go down. Okay? And we can kind of play with both of those. So what happens right here is, if this is the demand equation, and this is the supply equation, okay, right here there's more demand than there is supply. So right here there's more demand than there is supply. So there's an undersupply. Okay. Don't have enough in the market. Okay. There's more demand than there is uh, supply. Over here, there's more supply than there is demand. So under supply right here and over supply right here. And what would be important about that point right there? Not, not a break-even point, but we call it a point of equilibrium is what we call it. The supply is equal to the, to the demand. Okay, now, Logan's just going to cut his hair once, right? What if we were selling calculators or bikes or different things like that? What if you owned a shop that had bikes in it, okay? Um, would you want to have an undersupply of bikes? Like the minute they come in, so think about, think about iPhones, okay? When they release a new iPhone, they get a small number in, but there's a huge demand. So they've got an undersupply not meeting the demand. They'd want to sell more of them if they could, right? Okay. But do they want this? Do they want to order in a bunch of iPhones, have them come in, and then they only sell half of them, and they sit around? 
we don't want an oversupply. So ideally, we want to be right around this point most of the time. Okay? We want to have just enough supply to meet the demand, but we don't want to have an oversupply, so we've got them sitting on our shelves, and we don't want an undersupply, so there are people that came in, they wanted to buy one, but they couldn't because we didn't have one. Okay? That's called the point of equilibrium. Does that make sense? Okay. Price it right, have enough on hand, and they'll just go out steady. Okay. Have too many on hand? We might have to lower the price so people will come back in. Okay. All right. Um, that's the idea. It's a pretty easy equation to solve or system to solve. There you go. Any questions? Okay. How many problems did I assign from that section? <laughs>